Hi, welcome to the Eternity Online Service. So glad you could join us today. This is where we love Jesus, we praise Him, worship Him, celebrate His goodness in His Word and pray for you. So let's gather together and just spend time in His presence, worshipping Him.
go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And no mighty fortress. You go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And no mighty fortress. You go before us. Nothing can stand against the power. Well, that was a great praise session. It's always good to be praising God. And as I say nearly every week, God inhabits the praise of his people so we can have his presence, his glory and his goodness around us every day if we'll praise the Lord without ceasing. God is with you. He loves you and he cares about every little detail that you're going through. So as we seek him today, let's open our heart to receive all that he has for you. But Father, today I want to pray for all the people participating and viewing this online service. Mm -hmm. We ask today, Father, that your outpouring, this move of your spirit would touch each one yeah. and that right now those with any needs in their life whatsoever could receive healing, the touch of God, wisdom from heaven and have their dreams fulfilled, have their desires and needs fulfilled, Father, as they open their hearts to you in Jesus' name. I pray particularly for all those at the moment experiencing pain. I pray in Jesus' name for that pain to subside in the name of Jesus. Pain leaves right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you when you died on that cross, you paid the price for every sickness, every symptom. And I just declare health and healing and pain to leave now in Jesus' name. And I'm praying today, I just saw a vision of cracked heel, a very, very cracked heel with some very vertical, deep cracks right into the back of your heel. And in Jesus' name, I'm praying for that person right now and I'm encouraging everybody else to join me in agreement. We pray for those cracks to heal up, mm. for that heel to be completely healed in Jesus name and I rebuke whatever condition it is that's causing that and I claim Father complete renewing of the skin around that area that it be completely put right in Jesus name. I pray for those struggling with diabetes right now. I just command those symptoms to subside in Jesus name. I thank you Lord God we look to you for you are our healer. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Receive healing. Receive a subsiding of all those symptoms now in Jesus' name. We declare it health and healing in Jesus' name. I'm praying today for somebody and you've got a blocked ear. Just one ear is blocked up. I want you to put your hand over it if you can. Put your hand over your ear and then repeat what I'm about to say. Say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, on the basis of Jesus dying and carrying my infirmities and bearing my sickness and disease, I command this ear to open. I rebuke all blockage and command it to go. And I receive complete healing right now in Jesus' name. 
And I thank you, Lord, that I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. Amen. I'm praying for someone with a headache right now that's um, just like a, a pain stabbing in the side of your head. And I just declare healing in Jesus' name. Headache goes now. Pain subside in the name of Jesus. Headache be gone in Jesus' name. And while Rosanna was praying, I had a vision of somebody with a problem here in their eye, and it was like the whole side of their head was open up in the spirit, and God was working from the front to the back, dealing with something with the eye, the headache situation, and all the nausea that seems to accompany it, the tingling sensation around the eye, and in Jesus' name, it's gone. It left while Rosanna was praying, while I'm declaring this, and we claim complete healing for that person right now. Receive your sight restored and receive freedom from head pain and trauma, whatever caused it, in Jesus' name. I'm praying for someone with insomnia right now. You just can't sleep at night or you, you get to sleep and you wake up and you're just not getting a good night's sleep. I just declare the word of God says, I give my beloved sleep. And we just declare that promise for you right now. He gives you sleep. He gives his beloved sleep. You are his beloved. We thank you, Lord, for a good night's sleep tonight in Jesus' name. And we thank you for it, Father. I'm praying for somebody, you're having some trouble digesting food. When you first eat it, it feels good, it goes down, everything feels right. But then as time rolls on, it gets worse and worse. You get these feelings of indigestion. It's not right, it's not being digested properly. And it's concerning because it keeps you awake at night. In Jesus' name, I speak to the whole digestive system that's affected and I command it to work properly. I take authority in the name of Jesus against anything that's blocking that up or slowing it down, and I claim complete digestion, full nutrition from all of the food that comes in, and a complete healing to that whole situation in Jesus' name, including peace and tranquility from God that goes with it in Jesus' name. As we continue to worship God, continue to receive from Him. God loves you. Give him the glory and all the honor and join with us together as we worship him right now. you 
out with the old, in with the new. No matter how you see yourself now, no matter what you've done wrong in the past, you can forge a new identity that will be the foundation of who you can become. You are not your mistakes. You are God's masterpiece. It may be time to reevaluate and make some adjustments. Start getting rid of the old to make room for the new. You may have to get rid of the old way of thinking, speaking and living in every area so that you can progress forward. In the Message Bible, in Ephesians 4, 22, it says, Since then we do not have the excuse of ignorance, everything, and I do mean everything, connected with that old way of life is to go. It is rotten through and through. Get rid of it. And then take an entirely new way of life a God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces His character in you. The Bible says that no eye has seen, no ear has heard and no mind has imagined the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. Moved by His immense love for you, God has prepared wonderful things for you. He has done everything necessary for you to walk in all the things that He has prepared for you. We are the ones that have to be willing to change how we think, speak and act to receive all that He has prepared for us. Maybe it's time for you to open your mind to those things that you are capable of. You have unique gifts and strengths. If your old mindset is limiting your forward movement, then it's time to replace its redundant thought patterns. Then your articulation has to line up with your new way of thinking. Stop using your words to describe your life and use them to bring change to it. Our words are powerful weapons. As you declare what God says about your life, you will begin to line up with it. Our actions will begin to line up with our declarations. Our words and actions set the direction of our life. If you want to know where your life is headed, listen to the words coming out of your mouth because they come from the overflow of what is in your heart. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Words in the earth.
When you get rid of all the old limiting beliefs and self-sabotaging speaking, your whole life will begin to look different. An example of out with the old and in with the new is when you buy a new car. The old one comes out of the garage and the new one takes its place. You have a whole new confidence that the new one will get you to your destination without wondering if it will break down. You can reach your destination. Get rid of limiting beliefs and substitute them with unlimited beliefs of who you really are. Out with the old, in with the new. You are made in God's image.
The Urgency of Reconciliation Today we're going to read two scriptures for the foundation for this message. The first one's found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 25 to 26. Jesus said this during his Sermon on the Mount. Come into agreement with your accuser quickly while you are on the way with him to court, so that the accuser doesn't deliver you to the judge, and the judge deliver you to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you will certainly not get out of there until you have paid the last cent. Let's also read Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. This one's from the Passion Translation. Later, Peter approached Jesus and said, How many times do I have to forgive my fellow believer who keeps offending me? Seven times? Jesus answered, Not seven times, Peter, but seventy times seven times. The lessons of forgiveness in heaven's kingdom realm can be illustrated like this. There once was a king who had servants who had borrowed money from the royal treasury. He decided to settle accounts with each of them. As he began the process, it came to his attention that one of his servants owed him one billion dollars. And I'm sure that's a translation into today's money of the value of what Jesus had in the original story. So he summoned the servant before him and said to him, Pay me what you owe me. When his servant was unable to repay his debt, the king ordered that he be sold as a slave, along with his wife and children, and every possession they owned as payment toward his debt. The servant threw himself face down at his master's feet and begged for mercy. Please be patient with me. Just give me a little more time and I will repay you all that I owe. Upon hearing his pleas, the king had compassion on his servant and released him and forgave the entire debt. No sooner had the servant left when he met one of his fellow servants who owed him $20,000. Now, the $20,000 is a lot of money, but when compared with the $1 billion debt that he'd just been forgiven, it wasn't significant. He seized him by the throat and began to choke him, saying, You'd better pay me right now everything you owe me. His fellow servant threw himself face down at his feet and begged, Please be patient with me. If you'll just give me time, I'll repay you all that is owed. But the one who had his debt forgiven stubbornly refused to forgive what was owed him. He had his fellow servant thrown into prison and demanded he remain there until he repaid the debt in full. When his associates saw what was going on, they were outraged and went to the king and told him the whole story. The king said to him, You scoundrel! Is this the way you respond to my mercy? Because you begged me, I forgave you the massive debt that you owed me. Why didn't you show the same mercy to your fellow servant that I showed to you? In a fury of anger, the king turned him over to the prison guards to be tortured until all his debt was repaid. In this same way, my heavenly Father will deal with any of you if you do not release forgiveness from your heart toward your fellow believer. Now let's pray. Father, as we look at this word today, we're asking for your supernatural help to not only see what it says and to understand it and to be able to apply it in our life, but Lord, that we can put into practice what we're reading and see exactly with whom you are dealing with us today and the situations that you want us to attend to. And we're asking for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, this is a great story because when you think about it, the man owed him $1 billion. That's a virtually impossible bill for someone to pay. And yet the king forgave him. You know, that's the same as if you had a $500,000 mortgage and someone came and gave you $500,000 to pay it off. That is a gift of $500,000. It's a gift in the positive to compensate for the negative. And so this man just received, in effect, a gift of a billion dollars. And we could all ask ourselves the question, why wasn't he out celebrating with his friends? Why wasn't he rejoicing 
Why was he so worried about what somebody owed him? Maybe he hadn't really heard what had just happened. He hadn't really heard your debt is forgiven. Maybe what he heard was, now you've got a little more time, because that's what he begged for. But his debt was forgiven. He was just given a billion dollars. And yet, instead of celebrating, he was chasing down someone who owed him $20,000, an insignificant amount in comparison. This man wouldn't have to spend the rest of his life paying it off like you do with a mortgage. He just had it forgiven. It's gone. The debt's gone. Debt cancellation. But when he got his fellow servant, which, by the way, are all part of the same kingdom, and in those days the king owned it all, it was all his anyway, when he got his fellow servant and demanded the payment, it shows something was seriously wrong. And I guess we can see that today this applies in the way that if we don't fully understand and accept that Jesus has paid for our sin and that in some way we are still stuck with the idea that we have to compensate, make up for it, do good deeds that outweigh our bad deeds or something like that, we will never get past being demanding of other people. So that's the first thing today. Realise that when Jesus paid for your sin and God forgives you, it's a free gift that puts you out of debt to God. It's something you couldn't pay off even if you were thrown into prison. It can't be paid off. Today, we're looking at the urgency of reconciliation. And of course, when we start to read this in the Sermon on the Mount, we will see that some of Jesus' lessons are tough. But he is the perfect trainer. He's the loving Lord. He's the servant leader. He doesn't want us to die. His objective is to keep us alive, to keep us out of prison, and certainly to keep us out of hell. That's why he tells us this, because he wants what's best for us. Amen. Now, remember in life, some things are urgent, some things are important, and some are both. For example, it might be urgent but not important. The cat wants to get in. I was at my friend's house and the dog kept scratching on the window. It was irritating. It was becoming urgent that the dog gets back inside, but it probably wasn't that important. Some things are not urgent or important. Like right now, my flesh would love to eat some cake and cream. That's not urgent or important. And sorry, flesh, request denied. You won't be getting any. Some things are important but not urgent. For example, I want my daughter to marry the right man. That's important. But when she's a baby or a little girl, it's not urgent. Amen. <laughs> but some things are important and urgent. The little boy was about to touch the heater, the bar radiator, and his mum kept telling him, don't do it. That was urgent and important. The cat wants to go out because it wants to be sick. Urgent and important. There's a train coming toward the crossing. Get your car out of the way. Urgent and important. And for the farmer, there's a bull charging at you. Get out of his paddock, quick. That's urgent and important because if you don't, <laughs> he will deal with you. He's very strong. Amen. So unity in the body of Christ is both urgent and important to Jesus. This is one body under one Lord, filled with one spirit. Amen. This is the body of Christ. It's important to him that we be in unity. Before he died on the cross, Jesus prayed that we would be one. This is important to him. It's right in the last things he did on his bucket list before he died and left this planet, that we would be one. Amen. So our theme today is, what does Jesus say about fixing disunity? Because for him, it's urgent and important. Number one, he says that reconciliation is urgent and important. We're going to read this again from Matthew chapter 5, verses 25 to 26. And remember, this first phrase, first three words, is a command. That's what makes it important. He said, come into agreement. It's an instruction, it's our responsibility, and it's a command. Come into agreement 
with your accuser quickly while you are on the way to court. So the quickly there is telling us that it's urgent. Amen. This is urgent. Do it quickly. This is what Jesus said. Why? So that the accuser doesn't deliver you to the judge, the judge deliver you to the officer, and you'll be thrown into prison. And remember, this is also a picture of hell. And in hell, Jesus said, the worm doesn't die, the fire is not quenched. He talks about tormentors, where the torment doesn't stop day and night for eternity. Amen. Jesus says in verse 26, Truly I say to you, you will certainly not get out of there until you've paid the last cent. And I don't know how you can pay off a debt from in prison unless the rest of your family are busy selling off everything you own. And sometimes that is not enough. It wasn't enough for the $1 billion debt in Jesus' parable, and it certainly wouldn't be enough for the debt of sin and justice that has to be served on our sin that we owe God. Only he can cancel that debt. And it cost Jesus a lot to make the conditions necessary for that. Jesus had to die in our place, shed his innocent blood, rise from the dead to make our forgiveness possible. Remember, Jesus wants to keep you out of prison. He wants to keep you out of hell. He wants to keep you out of punishment and torment. And he thinks it's important. So that's why he says, come into agreement quickly. It's urgent and important. When I was a boy, they said a stitch in time saves nine. In other words, treat it urgently and it won't become over important. When the temperature warning light or beeper comes on in your car because it's lost all its coolant or water, that's urgent and very important. Amen. When a mozzie lands on your hand ready to sting you, you've got to do something quickly before the sting takes effect. That's urgent. So I've got to ask you this question. Do you accept today that there are situations, people, things in your life that have to be reconciled? If so, to Jesus, it's important. And for you, it's urgent. Some you have to speak to directly, and some you just sort out between you and God. Like it's no use going up to someone and saying to them, I've always hated your hairstyles. Do you forgive me? You know, if you haven't said anything and that was never spoken out loud before, don't go up and say it now. Just deal with it between you and God. Amen. If you've spoken to other people about it, then you need to go back to them, repent to them, and start saying good things about the person. So what does Jesus say about fixing disunity? Number one, he says reconciliation is urgent and important. Number two today, he says reconciliation is about coming into agreement. This is crucial. He says it there again. We read that same scripture. Come into agreement with your accuser. So it's far more than a handshake, a grunted, no problems, or a resumption of normal relationships. You know, like get over it, build a bridge and get over it. Coming into agreement is more than that. So if the person has something genuinely to accuse you with, something you've done, you've got to come into agreement by saying, I agree with you, I did it, I was wrong. Amen? Can you hear that? I did it, I was wrong. What you said about this is right. I'm coming into agreement with you. When you come before God, you've got to take the same approach. You know, if you stole something, you've got to come to God and say, I agree with what you're saying. I stole it. I was wrong. I'm going to give it back. Amen. That's coming into agreement. And that's what Jesus said to do. Not just get over it, not just forget it, but come into agreement with the person, full agreement. That's a big ask. And thank God he has the power and the ability to bring us to that point of agreement and full reconciliation. Amen. So what does Jesus say about fixing disunity? He says reconciliation is urgent and important and reconciliation is coming into agreement. Number three today, he tells us how to reconcile and come into agreement. 
As I said, it sounds like that. You are right. I was wrong. I agree. I did it. Okay. Then you are agreed. For example, yes, I did steal your money. Or yes, I did say that and I was wrong. Yes, it was me who damaged your property. Only after you confess your fault honestly, humbly and repentantly can you really, truly ask for forgiveness. Make restitution where possible and pray for healing and restoration. James says in 5.16, Confess your faults to one another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Remember to be accurate, honest, humble and repentant. Be accurate in when you confess. Be honest. Be humble and repentant. The examples I've just given can lead to repentance. Repentance and reconciliation and restitution are the only genuine and right ways to be free of guilt. Guilt cannot be resolved by justifying your actions. Justifying sounds like this. Yes, I did it, but I had a very good reason. These types of responses do not get rid of guilt. They do not reconcile disagreements or bring healing. The other person might pretend that they got over it, or maybe they can get over it, but it hasn't come into agreement or full reconciliation. Guilt cannot be resolved by counter accusations either. We sound like this. Yes, I did it, but I did it because you did this. You know, when you accuse people like that, you did this, you sound like the accuser. You don't sound like Jesus. Jesus is the excuser. Jesus has a response of, neither do I condemn you, right? But if you use the other person's sin to justify your sin, you're going in the wrong direction and you sound like the accuser. Amen. Also, guilt cannot be absolved by compensating for the wrong with other good works. Now, if you stole something, you've got to make restitution by giving it back or giving back the equivalent amount. Amen. But you can't make up for stealing it but being nice to somebody over here and being nice to somebody over there and giving some money over here and putting some money into the salvos, that won't reconcile and deal with the original problem. You've got to make restitution to the hurt party. And also in this, remember, I'm always responsible for my sin and the hurt that I've caused. The other person is responsible for theirs. Now, in a given scenario, the other person might be 99% in the wrong, and I may only be 1% in the wrong, but I've got to deal with my 1%. I don't go to the other person to fix up their 99% if I've got a problem. And besides, according to Jesus' spec and log illustration, it's more likely that I'm 99% wrong and they're 1% wrong. First, I have to deal with what's wrong in my life, what have I done wrong? I might not have spoken in love. I might not have responded properly. I might not have gone one on one when they did something to me, like Jesus said. Instead, I may have gone to a whole lot of other people and complained to them. I always have to deal with what I've done wrong before I expect the other person to deal with theirs. Amen. Yes, this is going to take great humility obedience to Jesus, you've got to be a worshipper in spirit and in truth, and you're going to need a word from God and God's grace to be able to do this, but it's a command, it's urgent and important. Let's read it the way Jesus said it. Matthew 18, verses 15 to 17. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. It doesn't say to hate him, but you treat him as an unsafe person, if you finally get to that last step. And then, of course, you've got to continue to do right things by him, 
love him, pray for him. And this God says, don't pray for him. Okay. So the first step was you go one on one. You keep sin as privately as possible. Now, because I'm a pastor, some people may come to me and say, this person sinned against me. What do you think I should do? Well, I go one on one. Yes, do it. Now, they've already disclosed it to me, which I keep secret. But it still would be better to just simply obey Jesus and go one on one. Then if they don't listen, then you go back with one or two others that in the mouth of two or three witnesses. And this would be people that maybe know about this or would agree with you or can see this very clearly. In other words, spiritually mature people. If he refuses to hear when you go with two or three, it's quite serious then. Most people would back down by then. Then you tell it to the church. So if you need the coaching from the pastor, go along. But now that you've heard this, you probably don't. If you get past step two and they still haven't listened, then you show it to the church and the pastor then would have the option of bringing in his elders, his board, his team or whatever. And in some cases, it may be shown to the church or the membership. Depends what it is. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. And there are other scriptures that go with this. In some places it's called excommunicating or they're not in the church anymore. And Apostle Paul actually spoke about handing some people over to Satan in other words, taking the covering prayer off them, let them alone out there in Satan's world kingdom so that they can learn the consequences of their actions now and then hopefully repent before they end up with eternity in hell. That's a message for another day, but it's very, very extremely important to do this exactly how Jesus says to do it and do it with love, do it with humility, and I can only recommend that you do it after a lot of prayer and hearing clearly from God what it is that they've done that you're going to them with. If you just make sweeping accusations and all that kind of thing, it won't work. It has to be a specific word from God. Then this process will work. So what does Jesus say about fixing disunity? Number one, reconciliation is urgent and important. I'm going to keep repeating this. Reconciliation is coming into agreement. It's not just shaming somebody into getting over it. It's coming into agreement with them. And number three, Jesus told us how to reconcile and come into agreement. And number four, make restitution where possible. So remember, I've said it already. If you stole money, give it back. If you spoke against someone and damaged their reputation, go around building it up. If you broke something, fix it or pay for it. A friend of ours loaned her car to a young woman in the church who drove up the road, got in a car accident and walked away and wouldn't take any responsibility for it whatsoever. I don't think that would be making restitution because even if the insurance fixed it, there's still a lot of paperwork and bits and pieces to be done that the owner of the car has to go through and it's costing them their time, their effort, and maybe even some money and the excess and then increased insurance premiums in some cases. So it's always good to stand with the person, make restitution, make something up to them to help compensate their time and energy and the money they've lost. There are things you can do to bring restoration, reconciliation, and come into full agreement. And please remember that no amount of random good works can ever remove the guilt of the original problem. And it has to be reconciled, which comes back to this idea again, that sometimes I get told, you've got to forgive yourself. Now, we have to be very, very cautious about how we apply that. For example, if I went next door and stole his car and drove around with it, and then next time he saw me, he says, you stole my car. And I said to him, don't worry about it, mate. Everything's okay. I forgave myself. Would that fix the problem with him? I don't think so. 
what about if you appeared before the judgment seat of Christ and you said you've got all these sins in your life and you said to him, yeah, but I forgave myself. It's not the same thing, is it? The person that you hurt, you need to repent to them and ask for their forgiveness. All sin is against God one way or another. And you receive forgiveness from the person you've wronged. Remember when David committed adultery, got a girl pregnant, and then killed her husband to cover it up. He said in Psalm 51 to God, he said, against you and you only have I sinned. So it's all about coming to God and asking forgiveness, every sin, whether it's against another person. Now, of course, you go to them, ask for their forgiveness, but you go to God. And when you're fully reconciled, you know you're forgiven, the guilt's gone. I strongly doubt at that point that you would have to forgive yourself. Besides, I don't think I've got the authority to forgive myself unless I sinned against myself. Amen. I don't want to get too far into this, but I just think the idea of telling someone that you've hurt not to worry about it because I've forgiven myself is ridiculous. And also remember, the only way to resolve guilt and to be free of it is by full and frank confession of the wrong and by asking for forgiveness, primarily from God. Let's read this now in Psalm 51 verse 4. David said, Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. That last half of the verse is saying to God, you are right in the way you see this and what you say about it. So it's coming into agreement. But he does say against you and you only. He doesn't seem even to leave room to say I sinned against Bathsheba and her husband and all the people in the army that saw what I did, and all the people in the palace who saw it. He says, against you and you only have I sinned. So, like I said, it always ends or begins with going to God, confessing and asking for forgiveness, making restitution, and confessing to the person if you've sinned against them as well. Amen. So, what does Jesus say about fixing disunity? One, reconciliation is urgent and important. Two, reconciliation is coming into agreement. Three, he tells us how to reconcile and come into agreement. And number four, make restitution where possible. And number five, urgent reconciliation is necessary to avoid the tormentors. And I think this idea of the tormentors is speaking about the torments of eternal hell for those that don't take this message from Jesus seriously, but it's also a torment that torments us while we're living here. And of course, it is an open door for the enemy too. Unforgiveness, non-reconciled things, things where you look down on someone and think, oh, I shouldn't have to ask for their forgiveness. They're just below me. They should just get over it. That's going to open the door for the enemy and the tormentors. So let's read now from the New King James Version this story Jesus told, and we read earlier, about the man that owed a billion dollars, got forgiven, but then was merciless on his fellow servant who owed him $20,000. Let's read it now, Matthew 18, 34 to 35. And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers, or tormentors, until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So remember, if you humbly, honestly, accurately confess what you've done to hurt somebody, come into agreement with them and ask them to forgive you, the ball is in their court. In other words, it's up to them to respond wisely to what you've said. If they don't forgive you, that then becomes their problem. Amen. And Jesus says here, So my heavenly Father will also do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespass. If you did the reconciliation attempt properly, then they could be in trouble if they don't forgive you. We see here why Jesus is so adamant about the urgency of reconciliation and coming into agreement. When it's our turn to forgive, we must act mercifully, humbly, and speedily. We can never get away from the law of sowing and reaping. 
Amen. How we treat others becomes the way we'll be treated. God said that. He put that law into motion. If we don't forgive, what we're sowing results in us not being forgiven. And remember, you always reap more and greater. So if you sow unforgiveness to your friend, then if God's forgiveness doesn't come to you, you're in a lot worse trouble. It's a very serious situation. So remember, God has far more authority than any human judge. His judgments are final and everlasting after you die or after the rapture or whatever. Between now and then, we can get things right. But if we wait till the trumpet or till we die, you can't put it right. That's why it's urgent. It's always now, because we never know when we're going to be called home. Amen. What's more, his prison is permanent and the eternal torturers are merciless. And it'll be too late to ever repay the very last penny. Number six today, Jesus is telling us the same thing again in another gospel. In other words, this is the second witness in the New Testament for this. Luke 12, 57 to 59. Why can't you decide for yourselves what is right? When you are on the way to court with your accuser, try to settle the matter before you get there. In other words, it's urgent. Otherwise, your accuser may drag you before the judge who will hand you over to an officer and you will be thrown into prison. And if this happens, you won't be free again until you've paid the very last penny. Today, I want to encourage you, deal with broken relationships today. Deal with their bruised. Even if the person is acting like they got over it, it still might be a matter of you asking for forgiveness for what you've done. Come into agreement with your accuser quickly. Means do it now. Make that call today. Schedule that visit. Write that email. Do whatever it takes. Do whatever you can to initiate the kind of dialogue that can bring you into agreement. Even if the other person has a mountain of wrongs they've done against you, deal with yours first, even if it's minuscule in comparison. Jesus brings this point home, doesn't he? Let's read it. Matthew 7, 3 to 5. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own eye? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye. Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you'll see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. And number seven today is get fully reconciled to God and to others. Isaiah says this, wash yourselves, cleanse yourself, remove your evil deeds from my sight. It's God talking. Stop doing evil. Learn to do what's right. And 1 Corinthians 15, 34, awake to righteousness and do not sin. So we need to do this. We need to get this sorted out. Holding unforgiveness is sin, apart from the original sin. Living without reconciling is sin because Jesus makes it a command. Come into agreement with your accuser. Amen. Come into agreement with them quickly. It's a command to not do that. Now that we've been looking at what he said is definitely sin. Today, can I encourage you, if you haven't done this or you haven't started this process, maybe you need to give your life to Jesus. You need to come to him as Lord, confess your sin to him, turn from your old life and start following him today. Can I encourage you to do this right now? So repeat this prayer after me which is calling on the name of the Lord, confessing his Lord, acknowledging your sin and your old life and seeking him to come in with his new birth to bring in a whole new change and you've received full forgiveness. So say this after me, Jesus, you repeat that. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I turn from my old life. I turn from all of my sin. I ask you to forgive me. I receive you as my saviour. I confess that you are my Lord. I receive your new birth today. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. 
and I thank you that my name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm asking for this in Jesus' name. And Father, today I'm praying for every one of us, for your grace in our lives, to be able to do the things that you've been saying to us today, to get reconciled, to come into agreement, to do it quickly and to do it properly in your way. And I ask, Father, that there will be complete agreement and I bind up every work of unforgiveness, every spirit that's trying to hold people in disunity. I break the power of all of those disunifying devils and in Jesus' name, I loose all of our participants and viewers today into the grace of God for forgiveness with the same love and the same power that was on Jesus when he said, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. And Father, I pray that each of us can forgive from our hearts all those that have hurt us, even if they don't repent to us. And even if they don't seem ever to turn from it, we forgive them and we do not hold any unconfessed sin. We do not hold any unforgiveness and we do not hold back from restitution. Show us who, show us how to make restitution and how to deal with this in Jesus' name. Well, it's been so good to have your company once again today. We love you and we appreciate that you've joined us. We'll be praying for you throughout the week and I want to encourage you again, stay in the Word of God, listen to the audio Bible, read the Bible, watch our messages, read the daily teaching and stay with God, stay in tune with Him pray for others, encourage others, and keep walking with Jesus. So until next time that we meet, from Dave and Rosanna, it's bye. bye.